Hi, and welcome back to Ghosties. I'm Macy. And I'm Natalie. We have a topic today that we've touched on a little bit, I think, back in our near-death experiences episode. So if you haven't seen that one, it's pretty interesting. Go ahead and watch that. We'll link it if I remember to do that. <laughs> so go ahead and watch it. But this week, we're talking about end-of-life experiences. Ooh! It has many different names, depending on who you're talking to and who's doing the research. But it's also referred to as nearing death awareness, deathbed dreams or deathbed visions, end-of-life dreams, end-of-life visions. You get the point. Mm -hmm. I like hearing um, these stories on like TikTok. There's like uh, hospice nurses yes. that will tell stories. And sometimes they're chilling. Chilling. I've read some. Like ones where people will be like, in 1917, I killed a man, and then they die. Oh no, no, no! That's what? deathbed confessions. Mean? Yeah, but or like just or there's one where I saw, and I'm probably like making this up, but like she um was like scared and said she was seeing like the devil like coming mm -hmm. to get her or something like that. I didn't put any I, negative ones in here. I would be so scared because they're they're not there aren't that many, but they're they're juicier. They get yeah. There the blood flow in a little more yeah <laughs> basically what they are are angels and deceased loved ones usually come to see people when their time of death is near yes and it's always been a topic of interest for me and we even have family members who have witnessed these experiences firsthand did you know that i, I think i know what you're talking a little about bit. our mom said that not long before yeah. her cousin passed away she was looking up in the corner of her room and she turned to her and said do you see them do you see the angels they're beautiful yeah i remember she's told us that before and our mimi said that um a week or so before her mom passed she said she heard her talking from her bedroom in the, in the middle of the night and so she went in there to see what was going on and she said that she heard her mom say don't go bill don't go which bill was her husband who had passed um, a couple of years before her. I didn't know that. And then our Mimi said there were several instances of um, where she claimed that there were people walking outside of her room. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I shut the door. I don't want any of those people coming in here. Yeah. And she also claimed to see angels. Yeah, I knew about that. Um, like a couple of times too yeah. in her bedroom. And um, what's strange is that our Mimi said that she was lucid every time. Yeah. And and she had dementia, but every time she was talking to my Mimi about this, she was very lucid and, and very there and not delirious or anything. And she said to her verbatim, I got this quote, I know you think I'm crazy, but I'm not. There are angels in here. That just gave me a chill. That's beautiful. Woo! And even before our great grandpa <laughs> passed away, her husband, Bill, he would look up in the corner and just stare almost mesmerized up into the corner of the room as like a... Yeah. As the time got nearer to his death. And before he passed, he, I think we said this in another episode too, he asked to be baptized. And my Mimi thinks, or our Mimi thinks, that it's because of he was seeing angels or whatever he was seeing yeah. caused him to kind of yeah. believe at the end. That just kind of made me sad. I think of him every time I have like vanilla ice cream because I that was my favorite and that was his favorite. And so no, like we, it together. we bonded over that. Yeah. That's what we're talking about today. We also have another tea, another, another latte. Sorry, Natalie. It's a London fog. It's from the Republic of Tea, another concentrate mixed with milk. So we'll see how this goes. Yep. And we've been talking for like an hour. So it's cold now. So let's go. I don't like it. It tastes like the milk from Fruity Pebbles. Yes. Yeah, yeah, like that, exactly that. I had Fruity Pebbles today, actually. I'm not uh, a drink the milk after the cereal type of person. Really? Disgusting. I always do. To me, that is like having a bowl of ice cream and then sopping up the melted ice cream at the bottom. You're sick. Sopping it up like what? Like Or like oh, scooping. scooping it up. I also do that. That is sick. That's waste. That's a waste of ice I, cream. Okay, first of all, I eat my ice cream fast enough to where mine doesn't really melt like that. I'm going in. Okay. But yeah, no. If you drink the milk after the cereal, I think that's disgusting. I don't know why. I think you're an outlier. Let us know in the comments. <laughs> I don't know. I think you're an outlier there. I don't like... I think that's normal. I don't like flavors in milk other than like chocolate. You don't like strawberry milk? No. Hmm, interesting. The devil. <laughs> I... <laughs> I, um, in school, when, like, if you were a strawberry milk kid... I was disgusted with you. I never said it, but I would watch the kids that picked up the strawberry milk and I was like, you got something weird going on, don't you? For those of you who don't know, if you think of Natalie in the terms of the movie Inside Out, Natalie is disgust. To my core. Just, yes. It, like that is her personality in, in totality. Yeah. Everything makes me sick to my stomach. I'm very... She's been that way her whole life. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty easy to make me like want to throw up. 
Yes. We'll start with a story that I found of a woman in training to become, a, I think it was a nurse, when she witnessed her first end of life experience. I recently witnessed a profound deathbed vision while on site during a training. An older woman in the later stages of pancreatic cancer who was under close supervision due to her declining condition was, understandably, upset. Although she was declining, she wasn't expected to pass for another few weeks. I was shadowing an older resident RN on site and we stopped by her room and we chatted with her for a while. The usual charting and pain management. Suddenly, her demeanor changed completely to one of complete happiness and acceptance. She smiled, gazed to a corner of her room like she was staring through us and remarked, Oh, thank goodness, Randy. I was afraid you wouldn't show up. I'm ready now. As I was informed later by another nurse who had spoken with the woman's daughter, Randy was her husband of 32 years who had passed some years prior. She sat up smiling, reached for a corner of the room. Her breathing subsequently slowed, and you could see the life leave her body as she took her last breath and she fell on her pillow behind her. The resident RN, who had been there for about 20 years, didn't even bat an eye and said, this is incredibly common. Oh my god. I told you you might cry this episode. The yeah, I don't expect to get so emotional over people I don't know, but like, what do you mean? That's beautiful, isn't it? That oh, she's like, yes, I, she was ready to go. I'm ready now that I've seen you. Yeah, that reminds me. I've probably talked about it before on the pod. I don't know. Let me know. But there was this guy. He was a regular that used to come into my uh, restaurant that I worked at. Mm -hmm. He told me two weeks before he died that he was ready to go. He told me he was like 94 Interesting. and I was sitting at the table with him because that's what he always wanted someone to sit with him. And um, I was sitting at the table with him and he was telling me about his life and all the things he's done and all this stuff. And then he was like, you know, my wife passed, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I'm, I, I'm ready to go. I've, I've lived enough. I'm ready to see her again. Aww. Two weeks later, had his lunch at the restaurant, went out in the parking lot to his truck and passed in <gasps> his truck in the parking lot. Oh my gosh. That's kind of sad. Have I not told you that before? I don't remember if you have. Oh my God. I feel like That's I tell like everybody that. Poor memory of yours. Yeah. And I'm just like, mm. But he had told me literally it was two weeks before that he's, he told me, he's like, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I, I want to see her again. That's interesting. So it made me like. <laughs> End of life experiences like these aren't necessarily recognized by the medical community as a whole. There is no agreed upon medical term for the events and there isn't really any training given to physicians going into palliative care or how to deal with these experiences. Basically at all. Like yeah. you don't learn this That's in strange. medical school, which is weird because you it's would very think. common. Yeah, I mean, they have to be around it all the time, especially going into like hospice well, type not, things. Not regular doctors, but yeah, hospice. Yeah. It, especially if you ask any hospice nurse or personnel working in term like with terminally ill patients or anything like that, they all have stories. They all the, all of them. Yeah. All of them. And they're all beautiful <laughs> yes basically yeah they know that once their patients begin to experience visions and dreams of their loved ones then their time is near there are some physicians working in these settings who will take these people's experiences at face value and decide that it's just delirium and offer patients medication just kind of like they're there yeah Shh, go to sleep yikes <laughs> But there are some like Dr. Christopher Kerr of Hospice and Palliative Care Buffalo um, who see these experiences as a sign that their patient is at the end of their lives and they, they know that this is it. Yeah. Though there isn't a lot of scientific interest in the study of end-of-life dreams or visions, Dr. Kerr has put in much time and effort in understanding these experiences and the impact that they have not only on his dying patients, but their families and their grieving process as well. Yeah. One key element to these is that they differ greatly from typical hallucinations or delirium. Hallucinations tend to be more stressful for the patient, including details like a hidden enemy or someone kind of out to get them or yeah. hiding in their room or something. They're disorganized in their thinking while experiencing a hallucination, and there is a, a disorientation involving a, a breakdown in attention and awareness of the patient, usually, mm -hmm. when having a, a hallucination. And though roughly 16% of ELDVs, which is kind of shorthand for these, so I'll say that so I don't have to <laughs> drag out the whole word every time, but um, though there's only... About 16% of these that seem to be negative, though very reformative in these uh, experiences, the overwhelming majority of experiences are completely positive mm -hmm. and still reformative, which is interesting. Thankfully, they're positive because I feel like if there were a ton of dark ones. Uh, yeah, that would be too, I, too I, much. I, yeah, too much for me. They're accompanied by lucidity and a period of clarity for the individual. They occur in the absence of acute conditions like cerebral hypoxia or any pulmonary or cardiac trouble. Unlike NDEs, the patients are not in any kind of life-threatening situation or imminent danger, placing them on the brink of death. Mm -hmm. So they're just, they're near death, but they're not in. Like their endorphins are going and, in there. Yeah. You know, like how some of the NDEs are. Yeah. Their heart's not stopping. Nothing like that. No, they're just awake. They are fully aware and sometimes fully awake. 
and uh, are capable of telling their stories with great clarity in the midst and after. Dr. Kerr describes these events as inner subjective experiences at the end of life. And he claims in his experience that they aren't exactly dreams, but it's hard to find anything else to compare them to. Many patients will tell them that they don't usually dream and say that the visions uh, that they have are more unlike dreams than they are like dreams. They hmm. said they're not like dreams at all. Okay. So like they're like just visions that they see like visions, awake, like how um he dr kerr described them as said they they seem more like lucid dreams like they're just so real okay but like they're in it like if you walk into the room you can't see what they're seeing but okay they can see what they're seeing while they're awake but they see you walk awake in the room too. and dreaming too mm, okay it happens sometimes when they're dreaming well that freaks me out there's a connection with dreams for sure i don't like that why because i'm such a, a dream driven person oh, it freaks me like, out I believe always, in your dreams. Oh, 100, yes. Yes, because I am psychic. I swear <laughs> I am Raven Simone in my head, but only when I'm sleeping. This might be off topic, but like I've always felt like I'm either going to have a dream or like I'm going to wake up that day. I'm going to know the day I die. I'm going to know before it happens. Well, let me know. I've always felt that way. I've always just been like, well, yeah, I'm going to know. I'll, I'll have a feeling that That's day. That's very interesting. You I don't know that I want to know. No. I just, I always thought like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll probably feel it. I'll probably know. I think about the aftermath of my death a lot. I don't think about my actual Me death too. a lot. Anyway, I don't want to talk about that anymore. <laughs> These experiences are, are something where the patient feels and sees and can sense everything around them. They can smell comforting scents and feel the touch of their loved one's hands against their skin. Everything is clear and crisp. It's just so real and impossible to them to have yeah, they're not in been yeah what they witnessed you know dr kerr was quoted in an article discussing his research into these end-of-life experiences saying what seems to happen is that there's this progression where people almost have an affir affirmation of having lived and it lessens the fear of death the stories are just remarkable even the negative ones are probably the most transformational or meaningful what was also fascinating was who was in the dreams and far and away it was the people who loved or secured us best who loved us unconditionally you could be 95 years old, but it could be your mother's voice from when you were five that you're hearing. It's really quite profound. People tended to die as they lived. If you had tortured, distressed, tragic elements to your life, these processes didn't deny that. And they don't deny death. They almost transcend it. Oh, wow. That's comforting to think about. Yes, I agree. These dreams or visions can sometimes begin as long as one to two weeks before their death and seem to become more comforting and clear the closer they get to death, often becoming the most peaceful one to two days um before their final hour. They are visited by people they loved who have passed on, sometimes religious figures, and often included beautiful scenery and most comforting conditions, like a childhood home or a regular vacation spot, like if they're in their dreams. Yeah. The people in hospice and palliative care who do dream claim that they often dream of loved ones still earthside. So th th they dream more often of the people that they love that are yeah. coming to visit them in in hospice and at their homes and stuff, friends and family that, that are still here. And... As they approach their life's end, the dreams become more realistic, and then they begin to dream of loved ones who have passed. Mm -hmm. So the closer they are to death, the more they're in tune with the, the other, the other world, side. Yeah. yeah, And even pets. I knew it was going to get there, and I really don't want to talk about it. I won't harp on it too much, but okay. I just thought it was something worth mentioning here. Well, yes, but it makes me um, cry. <laughs> even better, the loved ones visiting will look um, youthful and healthy just like kind of at their their peak in life yeah kind of how they come in near-death experiences too mm -hmm. where it's not always how they look at the end of life but they're i don't know if you get to pick like you just go to heaven and you're like i want to be 22 again yeah I was strong and lean and healthy that's interesting because i don't know if i've hit my peak yet i hope not Sometimes the loved one that has passed will remain silent and just be a comforting presence with a nice smile on their face and provide reassurance to the dying that they're not alone and they will be heading off to somewhere beautiful. Many of the encounters I've read included traveling with no set destination. The patients will feel that there's some urgency to the trip they'll be taking and they feel as if they need to pack or, or get their suitcase or they need to get ready and put their shoes on. Oh, that's going to make me cry. Yeah, they prepare for their departure. Sometimes they'll see a train or a plane or a vehicle that will take them on to somewhere. It's the Harry Potter train. That's what I would envision. Yes, it's like King's Cross Station. Yes. Basically, yeah. That's what, like when you said that, that's what came to mind. There was a, a woman that 
dream that she would be picked up and arranged for a journey. The person telling the story was quoted as saying, I don't think she said dream, but experience. And her husband, who had been deceased, had ordered his travel service for both of both of them. And said, and the lady said, so now everything is in order. <laughs> That's really cute. And as I said, there are some people who experience a more negative vision or dream. And particularly if they've had a more difficult life. The patient will often see people who they believe they'd hurt or wronged and even revisit sites that house their trauma. Like if they have their most traumatic experience yeah. here, they would often in their dreams revisit this place. Ugh. I don't like that. The one good thing though um, about having these experiences is that most often uh, they end with some sort of resolve. Good. The person will receive a message or a feeling that puts them at ease and gets them ready for the end of their life. So I have one story. Dr. Kerr spoke of one man named Mac, who was a World War II veteran who stormed the beaches of Normandy on D-Day at the age of 17. Oh, no. During his time in hospice, and the reason that he went to the facility in the first place was um, he was having trouble sleeping. He often dreamt of the beach during wartime, and he served in the USS Texas and arrived offshore uh, as the battling commenced. The land was full of wounded and dead soldiers awaiting him as he ran far and fast to save as many men as he could. He was quoted speaking about the dreams. There was nothing but death. Dead soldiers all around me. What he a horrible experience. Yeah, it's very traumatic. Yeah, at 17. Yeah, so young. A very formative part of his Literally. life. He never talked about the war in his lifetime, but lived with immense guilt for all of the, the people that he felt that he left behind that day. Yeah, I can't imagine. <laughs> The dreams were the same over and over again, Mac reliving his greatest trauma and regrets. As his date of death approached, he continued to have these dreams, but one day there was a dramatic shift to his dreams and to his life. His first dream was of him reliving the day he received his discharge papers from the military. It was a comforting dream that gave him a bit of peace and reprieve from the frightening dreams he had been having, so he finally was able to kind of get a yeah. little bit of sleep at night. Aww. Next, he was visited in another dream by an unknown soldier. He didn't recognize him, but he was on the beach with him and had on the same uniform. He looked Mac in the eyes and said, Soon they, meaning the fellow soldiers, are going to come and get you. It was unspoken, but it seemed to Mac almost like he, his presence was forgiveness. Oh my god. It released all of the anxiety and stress uh, that his war trauma had been causing him whole, his whole life, and he died not long after that. I can't peacefully. imagine. I cannot imagine, like, harboring all that for your entire life. Yes. And he was old. Yeah. Like, he was in, like, in his 90s, I think. So you lived 70, 80 years just with that in your mind and thinking about that. Yeah. That's like really heartbreaking. I mean, I'm glad he got the resolve, but I wish he would have gotten that earlier and been able to just live life freely and not have to well, carry that. And here it was a, a fellow soldier that came, told him, yeah. like, we'll come get you when your time, your time's coming. We'll come get you. You're okay. I mean, that's beautiful, but that's really sad. It is sad. Many people from all different ages, backgrounds, socioeconomic statuses, cultures, and religions seem to have these same kind of experiences. It doesn't happen with everyone who is near death, but to enough that it is commonplace in facilities like the one Dr. Kerr runs. There seems to be some kind of profound psychic phenomena near death, which plays a significant role in easing the minds and spirits of those who are near their time. Patients will often look into the corners of their rooms with smiles on their faces. There are instances of people reaching out to the invisible spirit or entity and telling their loved ones about the beauty they're experiencing, kind of like our family did. Yeah. They will encounter long-deceased parents, spouses, children, friends. They can be visited by pets or beloved wild animals sometimes. Like if, like a lady just is an avid bird watcher. She'll Aww. see like beautiful birds yeah. that she saw in her lifetime. That's really sweet. Also, kind of horrifying though. Imagine being their <laughs> nurse and they're just reaching out going like, Mom. It happens a lot. Yeah, but like, I mean, it's beautiful when you think about it, but if I was the nurse in there, I'd be like, what? I feel like that's probably something you get used to. Yes, like the I'm The first sure. few times, I'd be like, please get away from me. Yeah, it would scare me But really after bad. a while, I'd be like, oh yeah, okay, Betty. Mm -hmm. Time for your medicine. <laughs> Betty. <laughs> I don't know. It sounds like an old lady name. It's my car's name. Is it? Yeah. Sometimes hospice nurses will even talk about a bird or a butterfly landing on the window of the person that passed as if their spirit is being flown off by the creature that they found beauty in. That's the most beautiful thing. There was one um, short little story. It said, Lorene had dreams of her mother in a beautiful garden saying everything will be okay. She told her family she wanted to sleep as her mother will return. Oh. <laughs> well, there's so many. I, I did cry a couple of times yeah. during research for this because it was very hard to 
read some of it. Just very beautiful and sad. Yeah, there's like not much else I can add to the specific stories other than, wow, because what do you say? Doctors don't really have a definitive reason as to why this may happen to patients when they get very close to the end of their lives, though there is a great amount of speculation, like whether it's caused by medication like morphine, a lack of oxygen to the brain, or maybe even just a psychological comfort provided by your mind linked to maybe religious beliefs or experiences in your life. Mm -hmm. These, however, don't seem to be proven and have a bit of evidence against them. I'll always bring bring the evidence, bring the tea. First, if the experiences were caused by the amount of medication the patient is on, why why visions of loved ones? Yeah. Why did these experiences of like loved ones taking them on a trip only appear in patients near death and not patients who are being treated for other things like with with using morphine as an example for pain management? True. I was cuz I was going to say like why vi- when you said vi- why visions of loved ones, I'm like, well, that's who they're thinking of, but then that but is true. Only the people that are are dying yeah see this like people who are just in hospital really like high levels of morphine just from maybe after a procedure or surgery or something don't see this stuff that's true you'd expect to see the same results if if they're only hallucinations brought on medication yeah that's true no i'm i'm with you second eldvs are as i said previously too clear to be brought on by a lack of oxygen also, there's no really proof that there's a lack of oxygen in these people's brains because they're still living. Yeah. Living enough to sit up and some of these people have been recorded talking Ooh. about their experiences. They're sitting up, chatting, walking still, yeah. living their lives. So if they're kind of coming in and out of delirium and hallucinations with like fragmented, it, it would be more fragmented. Is yeah. What I'm it wouldn't they're, sound it more would be so clear. Focused. Yes. Also, why would the hallucinations, the closer a patient the patient gets to their unknown death date, distinguish between visions of living and deceased relatives and loved ones. So when they start in their hospice care, it's usually living, they're dreaming of yeah. living, family and friends. And then the closer they get, suddenly there's a switch over into yeah. deceased. Like but they don't soul, know they're their like soul about to knows. die. Their yeah. soul's like switching over to the, to the other side. It's getting That's really crazy. They're more in tune because they're about to be with them. That's crazy. And most about. of these dreams don't contain any living people. Yeah, that's crazy it's to think about. It's only their loved ones that have passed. Last, ELDVs are experienced by people all over the world. All over. They have been written about for centuries, and no matter the person's religious background or beliefs, everyone seems to have the same experiences. Mm-hmm. Visits from their loved ones, and sometimes who they perceive as their religious deity no matter the religion, are common before death. Um, In fact, it seems that these visions are an intrinsic part of the dying process, no matter if the patient has received medication or believes in an afterlife. If it's it's just a religious thing, there are people who are just adamantly like, no, there's nothing after this who see this stuff. Mm -hmm. That's just like with the near-death experience people that are like, I was a complete atheist and then I almost died and now I'm like, whoop. Nope, there's something else. Mm-hmm. That's <sighs> These experiences help patients prepare for death and are thought by some to simply be a spiritual moment originating from the human desire for connection. Uh, the only problem with this that I have with this theory is the stories I've read of people having vertical knowledge of things that they haven't been told before. Like what? Well, there were several instances of people passing and claiming to see people um, there to greet them that they believe to still be alive though they had passed. So I'll tell you a story. There was um, one instance of two little girls named Jenny and Edith who had contracted diphtheria in June of 1889. They were schoolmates and best friends who played with each other often. Jenny had unfortunately passed from her illness, um, but the parents of Edith thought it would be best to keep it to themselves so Edith wouldn't have another thing she'd be fighting against Mm -hmm. her grief and fighting the diphtheria in fact just three days after jenny had passed edith asked that a couple of uh, photographs be taken to jenny kind of saying her goodbyes to her friend um so she thought she was still alive though jenny had been dead for three days oh my gosh not long after this edith woke up and began to say goodbye to her friends and family and spoke of dying soon she was unafraid and talked of all the loved ones that she saw before her ready to take her um take her on to the afterlife Then suddenly, with great surprise, Edith turned to her father and exclaimed, Why, Papa? I am going to take Jenny with me. Why, Papa? You did not tell me that Jenny was here. She then reached her arms out in front of her and said, Oh, Jenny, I'm so glad you're here. Oh, that just destroyed me. She didn't know her friend had passed and still saw her. That just destroyed me. And there were several instances like this where they had, um, like a cousin or a a close friend, friend or even a brother had passed while they were kind of in their dying process and they didn't know like they hadn't been told and come to find out like they see them and the family finds out later that they had passed already that hurts that makes me um 
wildly sad. Wow. Okay, but I mean, that's great. <laughs> I'm happy that she got to have her friend with her, but wow. I am more happy about this stuff than I am sad. Like, yes, sad, but death is a part of life and everyone will go through it at some point. I, it makes me so happy to know that these people are seeing people who brought them great comfort in their lives. Yeah. People they've missed. Yeah. Are, are there to greet them and it's not a scary process for them. Yeah. It takes all of the fear out of it. Ugh, yeah. I just don't like to think... I really don't like to think about death. Well, we're doing the wrong kind of podcast. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. But, like, it makes me panic, I guess. I don't know. It's just because, like, people... Like, they're just here one day and they're gone. But and they're just, not. That's the whole point of it. But this. it's hard to, like... That's a big thing that's hard for me to, like, grasp. Yeah. I'm not even going to make the joke right now. Firmly. Okay. But, no, like, I can't... It's just very... Yeah, we talked about this last episode about how it's hard to kind of wrap your whole mind around it. Yeah. I I find it more comforting than scary. That people just keep going? Yeah. That that people will keep going and then I'll just haunt your house. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But I don't know. I find that comforting. To me, it's just To like, know that everyone will be okay. <laughs> no, I want everyone to feel the loss of me. We will. <laughs> well... <laughs> Just kidding. I probably won't be here with you. Pass. Is there something that I don't know about to happen? No, no, no. It was a joke. Though these end of life experiences have been present for essentially all of time, true scientific study didn't take part until the 20th century. Sir William Barrett, a professor of physics at the Royal College of Science in Dublin, published a summation of his findings in 1926 after several years of study in a book called Deathbed Visions. Very on the nose. This was essentially the first part that science took in the study of ELDVs. One interesting thing that he found is um, in his studies is that many children who claimed to see angels were surprised that they didn't have wings. This is significant to me because if these visions and dreams are simply a product of our mind, our psyche, why wouldn't they show up as something we know? They like, would some, like we would picture show them. up like the little figurines, like little cherubs with wings and yes, yes, interesting. But they they'll call out like, well, "Oh, mom, the angels don't have wings." That's so like I thought they'd have wings. It's just Leo from Charmed. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> our uh, our picture is right here. <laughs> Imagine. That like, specific face. <laughs> That's who comes to visit you when you're dying is just Leo I'll from Charmed. It. I'll take it. Honestly, same. <laughs> there was more research done by Dr. Carlos Osis of the American Society of Psychical Research in the 60s and 70s, for which he wrote a book titled At the Hour of Death. He interviewed more than a thousand nurses and doctors who attended the deaths of uh, patients and found that more than 50% of dying patients will have a deathbed vision in, in his studies in the thousand people. Wow. That the mood of patients who have ex have these experiences improved drastically rather than having confusion or fear at seeing a, a ghost or a spirit of a person that had passed, the patients were comforted and willing to go with the spirits they were seeing. Aww. A 52 year old woman was dying of a failed transplant. She was terrified of dying and often spoke about how she was never going to give in to death. She was like, I'm absolutely not. Two days before her death, she kept looking over my shoulder and laughing and smiling at someone standing behind me. There was no one there. I asked the patient who she was talking to and she told me her dead father. Then she said, okay, all right, it's okay, I'm not afraid. She then died very peacefully smiling. It was such a relief to see the poor woman finally at peace. Good for her. That, yeah, I like that one. It warms my heart to yeah. know that all these people are have comfort. Like even if it, even people who like if they had a bad childhood at the hands of their parents, their parents don't come to see them. Yeah, it's their beloved aunt or their best friend that or helped the them family get they chose. It or, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... It's the people who love them unconditionally that come to to get them. <laughs> there are a few other contemporary researchers into the phenomenon of deathbed visions that you can find um you can find their talks on like ted talks which i found very intriguing yeah. one of them um was martha atkins if you have time look her up uh she has a really good um ted talk i might very good i'll send it to you i like ted talks i know that's like whatever but i, I do no, enjoy dude, them. that's not a hot take <laughs> no no not the hot take but it, i just feel like when i say any saying that just then made me feel like brian griffin <laughs> Like, okay, I see. Oh, it. I like I like TED Talks. It's like shut I'm a writer. up, girl. <laughs> yeah, shut up. Dr. Christopher Kerr, who we've been talking about and who I've got a lot of my information from, also has a TED Talk. Oh, so I might watch that. Oh, that actually. one too. 
maybe i'll link them i'll say link them so people can link them down below if i remember though i believe all of this research done in his field is significant i appreciate dr kerr because he's looking into this from a point of view of how it can provide comfort and assist in the care of the dying patients and their families in their final days together so it's got more of a focus not so much as this happens but this happens and this is the impact on these people yeah. which i really appreciate and i like someone looking it's the into humanity that. of it yes yeah he witnessed his father have an eldv at the age of 12 before his father passed he told his son that they needed to get ready because they were going on a fishing trip up to a cabin that the two of them enjoyed together over the years he was like oh. knew that there was a trip planned oh. when he became a physician like his father later in life he began to work in palliative care that's when he realized there was something more to the experience he had many years before wow. so he had the experience but didn't think of it until he became a doctor in hospice and saw people planning for a trip yes. oh that would break me during his first weeks working in the hospice facility he checked the stats and labs of one of his patients and requested to a nurse um that they give him some medication uh to help with his condition and the nurse asked if he was sure and said that he was going to be passing soon so i mean was there a point to it yeah the nurse went on to explain that the patient had been seeing his dead mother and dr kerr hadn't learned anything about that in med school but sure enough later that night the man passed away wow he was like okay maybe there's something to this yeah and it's crazy like the nurses they or like the whoever the doctors nurses whatever they know yes she was like um are you sure we should give him medicine because i don't i mean i don't think there's a point yeah he was like i didn't learn that in medical school and he this is a quote from his thing he said i didn't learn that medical school and she said there's a lot you didn't learn in medical school wow that's crazy he decided to stay in hospice care and had a great number of occurrences like this one over the years that he worked in this field that's why he decided to start his research and eventually write his book, Death is But a Dream, which I haven't read yet, but I definitely want to. Interesting. It's on my TBR. He conducted a series of seven research studies over the span of a decade, interviewing over 1,400 dying patients, in which almost 90% of these had ELEs and seemed more uh, that seemed more real than real life to wow. them. He found empirical evidence that these experiences are a frequent predictor of imminent death, and they are often therapeutically important. Mm-hmm. They used a method called the confusion assessment method as a way to rule out delirium. And uh, they did they did labs on these patients looking at medication lists and even filmed many of the people, like I said, to document that they were functional and clear over a long period of time, mm-hmm. sometimes starting months before their death. Wow. Because when they got entered into hospice. So they could see the, di- the change in personality and everything. Yeah. Yes. Makes sense. They also interviewed over 750 loved ones of the dying patients and found that the positive experiences and changes made for uh, made for the dying was also good for their families and seemingly making the transition through grief and loss a bit more manageable. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it gave their family lots of comfort knowing that their loved ones didn't pass alone and weren't They weren't fear. scared, yeah. yeah. Aww. The most intriguing piece for me in all of this is the fact that other cultures around the world have these experiences and even languages for this part of death, like like whole portions of their language to, to talk about this. One such group are indigenous people in the Amazon. In one article that I read, a researcher was talking to another um, doctor that they knew who was mm-hmm. working in Am- in the Amazon and talking. they were kind of talking about their experiences they've seen. And she's like, oh, this group of people has an entire part of their language talking about this so, like stuff that what? we don't have words for they have a whole explanation wow. for it because they experience it so often and, and know about it yeah wow it's a common way for some cultures and societies to maintain ancestral ties too mm-hmm. that's so what i was like thinking kind of see their i think of mulan. maybe a, jesus christ well i wasn't gonna think oh. mulan no i was <laughs> probably worse the avatar or avatar <laughs> the last airbender <laughs> when he has like the um all the avatars before him, you know, when he like yeah. kind of goes into his spiritual state and he can see all the line of all the avatars before him. Um, Mushu, waking up all the ancestors. Yeah. That's my ambition. <laughs> Pretty much. When you say ancestors, they're blue to me because of Mulan. I knew it. I <laughs> knew it. <laughs> yes. Oh, favorite, favorite Disney movie. It's not a goodbye, but I see you later as their loved ones pass on. And maybe one day we'll see all of the ones who've passed on before us again, waiting there to help us cross over into the beautiful afterlife. And maybe we'll travel by bus or plane with our friends and family and pets. And I really hope so. I've got a few stories if you'd like to hear. Just a few more little quick ones. I'm I'm trying to keep it together. Well, this is hurting let's full on cry here man no so toward the end of my father's long life he kept telling me he was seeing a little dog sitting in a chair next to his bed he described the dog in detail and would point his finger at it with serious certainty after he died going through a very old and dusty box of his things i found a sketch he had done as a child of his little pet dog sitting in a chair 
I put it on the cover of the card for his memorial service. <laughs> it was like the same dog that he had been describing to her. My mom passed away in 2023 after gra gradually declining from Alzheimer's. About a month or two before she passed away, she started talking about how she needed to get her suitcase down from the closet because she had a train to catch. And just a couple days before she died, when she had barely any, con she had been barely conscious for maybe a week, all of a sudden she opened her eyes, looked at a fixed point in the front of her, in front of her, and said, "Hi, Dad," <sighs> clear as day, in a calm, confident, hopeful voice. Then she closed her eyes and went back to sleep, as if nothing had happened. Her father had passed away about 20 years earlier and clearly came to guide her as he did he had done in life this is insane to me like obviously really sad but like how do these end of life visions differ from um near-death experiences because near-death experiences they all see something different but end of life it sounds like they're all seeing the same things is it just like the the chemicals in the brain and the endorphins and the adrenaline and da, 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 if you're like, oh, I'm going to die. And then like these people, they're chill. So they actually get to calmly well, see something. Well, people having near-death experiences kind of all see the same thing too. It, it, I there mean, was a bunch of differing ones. Well, yes, but it's the same. It follows the same line. And That's so do these. Like they're not all seeing the same person. They're well, seeing yeah. different places in their dreams if they're having dreams. Yeah. Different people. It, it's different words, diff different conversation, but it all kind of follows the same thing. Same yeah. Line. Okay. True. Okay. I don't know. Just thinking about the. Yeah. Anyways. Okay. Carry on. Final story. My mother had been in and out of hospitals over the last year, near death at each admission. She was coherent and not delusional. She had co she had congestive heart failure and lung and kidney cancer spread throughout her body. One morning in the hospital room, about two a.m., when all was quiet. My mother st stared out the door of her room and into the hall that led to the nurse's station and the other patients' rooms. Mama, what do you see? I asked. Don't you see them? She said. They walk the hall, day and night. They're dead. She yes. said this with quiet calmness. The revelation of the statement might send fear into some, but my mother and I had seen spiritual visions many years prior, so this statement was not a shock for me to hear or for her to see. This time, however, I did not see them. Her surgeon said there was no point in treatment as cancer had spread throughout her body. He said she might have six months to live at the most, maybe three months. I brought her home to die. The night of her passing, she was restless and anxious. A few minutes before 8 p.m., she said, I have to go. They're here. They're waiting for me. Her face glowed and the color returned to her pale, to her pale face as she attempted to raise herself and stand up. Her last words were, I have to go. It's beautiful. Oh. And then she passed at 8 p.m. Oh, my God. <sighs> comforting okay it was all comforting yes they're, but i'm they I'm were touched. all good and even the bad ones like the guy in the war even the bad ones have a at resolution. the end some kind of resolution for them and they're passing i didn't read any that seemed like they were i don't know about to get dragged off to hell or anything yeah which i didn't go searching for them because i, I don't particularly want to. want to no i liked i'd like to be comforted yes this was comforting i genuinely like generally don't like to think about death but this was comforting and made me like i oh. thought this was this made me feel so much happier yeah. about our life cycle yeah that was heavy though we really appreciate you taking the time to listen to us today, Ramble On. Um, don't forget to rate and review if you're on podcast. And please like, subscribe, comment on this video. Leave us a comment for the algorithm um, if you're on YouTube. Also, if you're on YouTube, if you care, Loose Leaves is out. We've got it linked in the description if you want to go hear us ramble on more because it is nonsense, but it's fun nonsense. So For us, at least. I don't us. know about y'all. Anyway. Let me know what you think of the thumbnails as well. Oh, yeah. this Thumbnails are Natalie's artistic vision come to life yes so yeah <laughs> comment Let me know. on that <laughs> follow us on instagram at ghosties pod to keep up with what we've got going on over there and if you have a creepy or supernatural story of your own please send them to us at ghosties pod at gmail.com we'd love to hear them we've got another listener stories brewing over here we're really excited to get that going mm -hmm. and we're so excited to continue on this adventure with you guys and we'll see you next monday goodbye